Good morning. On behalf of the CloudStack community team and our participating partners, I'd like to welcome you to the CloudStack Virtual Build a Cloud Day, July 10th, 2012. My name is Gerilyn Miller, and I'm a Principal Cloud Evangelist at Citrix. I'll be your host today. Before we get started, I just want to verify that everybody can hear me. So if um, somebody would be so kind as to uh, just send a chat and let me know that you can hear me. Um, what I'd like to share with you first is the agenda for the day, and then we'll talk a little bit about the format and turn it right over to our first speaker. So as you can see, we've assembled for you some of the open source industry's leading technologists to discuss, to discuss how you can build, deploy, and manage applications in an open source cloud computing environment. Each of the technologists on our agenda will deliver their session, and then what they're going to do is leave the last few minutes of their time slot for questions. So as we go along, please go ahead and um, type your, your questions in the GoToWebinar questions pane in the middle. And at the end, we will consolidate these, and the speakers will um, take the remaining part of their session to answer the questions. We will be recording each session, and when the webinar is completed, we'll send a follow-up email with instructions on where you can go to access the recordings. So we know this is a long day. We have a lot of uh, people on our agenda and sessions on the agenda, so if you have to miss one or two, you can always go to the recording afterwards. With that, let's get started. I'd like to introduce to you Mark Hinkle, Senior Director for the Cloud Computing Community at Citrix. Mark is going to be giving us a crash course in open source cloud computing. So with that, I'll go ahead and turn presenter status over to Mark Hinkle. Mark? All right. Can you hear me, Gerilyn? Yes, I can. All right. Great. Let me get into slideshow mode. All right. Okay. Uh, what I'm going to start out with today is sort of give you an overview of cloud computing in general and the open source tools that fit into um, cloud computing architecture and management. And then we'll let the people throughout the day fill in, in individual parts of that architecture with their individual technologies. So um, let's start with this. Um, I'm Mark Hinkle. As Gerilyn said, I'm responsible for the open source efforts at Citrix, basically with regards to cloud, Apache CloudStack and Zen, our open source hypervisor. Um, I joined Citrix via the cloud.com acquisition last year. Um, I've been an open source guy first and a cloud computing guy second, so that's where my passion is. Um, and that's why I think it's important to talk about um, how this fits into the general technology scheme, but um, what the open source options are for you so that you can go out and participate and build your cloud in the way that you choose right away. Okay, so I know a lot of you do know what cloud computing is, but it never fails that uh, there's some gaps in people's knowledge. So I'm going to give you a really quick overview of the who, what, why, when, and how of cloud computing, and then we'll talk about how the open source technologies fit into that um, architecture. So um, pet peeve is that everybody in our industry seems to take things that are connected to the internet nowadays and call it cloud computing. Um, it drives me nuts because not everything that is not available over the internet is a cloud service. Um, there's five characteristics of clouds. Um, these are what the definition from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the US, um, I think it gives us a good idea. Um, what real, we really need by cloud, on-demand self-service. You can provision your infrastructure through some automated means, usually a web portal or an API. Uh, broad network access, that basically could be on your LAN or that could be in the, net, in the internet. It just means that you have highly available, highly um, high bandwidth with low latency and you can connect to your cloud service anytime, anywhere. Uh, within the parameters you define. Uh, resource pooling, and this is the thing that most people um, are not 
qualifying when we talk about cloud services. If you have a hosted mail server, for example, and that mail server has a finite amount of space, a finite amount of CPU, and does not scale out, then it is not cloud computing just because it's hosted. If you have a pool of servers that allow your mail servers to scale out and add um, storage for your users and uh, receive and send at, at greater rates, that's resource pooling. A good example would be Gmail. Um, rapid elasticity, that means that your infrastructure can grow and shrink as you need it. So during your peak time usage, you can have more servers online. During the time where you're not using that compute power, you can shrink down and uh, reduce your heating, cooling costs, and your electricity. Um, the other key thing is it's all about measured service. You pay for what you use. Um, it's, uh, some people like to use the term utility computing. Uh, and back 10 years ago, that was a popular term. And it really means that just like electricity or water, as you consume it, you pay for what you use. Um, five characteristics of cloud. All right. The service models. Uh, service models, um, almost everybody that I would imagine everyone on this call is a cloud computing user in one of these service models, whether it be SaaS, which is software as a service, that's Google Docs, Gmail, Salesforce, uh, Red Hat Network would be software as a service, to subscription to a uh, technology service. The two that were and, and that I really obfuscates the infrastructure below it to the end user. I call that the user cloud. The two that I'm going to talk about today and that we're going to have a midst of a discussion around are um, platform as a service and infrastructure as a service. Uh, platform as a service is what we call the development cloud. So it is a containerized, scalable, um, portable place for you to develop your applications. Um, you do not have to interact with the storage and compute and networking in this model. Um, that is abstracted away. You get a development environment to create your apps and have it theoretically scale up and down. And Diane from Stacato is going to talk about that later today. Um, examples of PaaS besides Staccato, which is based on VMware's Cloud Foundry, would be Google App Engine, Windows Azure, uh, Rackspace sites. Uh, Red Hat's recently re released OpenShift um, and AppFog, which is another Cloud Foundry-based technology. Okay. Systems Cloud. This is basically your your legacy, your infrastructure that you're used to um, managing in discrete units, the storage, your networking, and compute. And what I infrastructure as a service does is it takes that those individual uh, resources and pools them. So it pulls your computing, it pulls your networking, um, it pulls your um, storage so that it abstracts all that to the end user and you can use those discrete elements in one pool that's elastic. So going back to our definition, infrastructure as a service gives you that, um, takes your existing infrastructure, makes it cloudy. Um, examples of this that that we probably are really familiar with would be like Amazon EC2 and S3, uh, Rackspace Cloud Files, um, OpenStack, CloudStack, Eucalyptus, Open Nebula um, are all examples of infrastructure as a service. All right. This is the final, final um, what is the cloud slide. And the terms that we're going to talk about today, we have um, the public cloud, that's where that infrastructure is hosted by a service provider, whether it's Amazon Web Services, Google App Engine, Rackspace, uh, Microsoft Azure, or private cloud, which is basically what, what our topic is today, is creating that cloud computing environment in your, your data center. And that would be um, CloudStack, OpenStack, Eucalyptus, Open Nebula um, are, are examples of that open source software to do private cloud, VMware uh, vCloud director would be a proprietary example. Now, um, the the cloud that we're not going to talk a lot about, but um, perhaps uh, Sebastian will, or when we do Scalar later today, 
is the hybrid cloud. And what that is is the ability to move resources or load balance between your private cloud and your public cloud. So, uh, for example, if you were a florist and all year long you have a steady um, um, sales volume and web volume, but all of a sudden uh, Valentine's Day comes, the idea would be that you could scale up your infrastructure to handle that um, influx of orders for that very short amount of time without having to make the investment in uh, hardware to handle that that uh, spike. So um, hybrid cloud is, is really a use case that we talk about, but I don't think is the norm for a lot of the enterprise users, unless you're in that sort of retail, in a situation similar to my retail example. All right, that is an overview of cloud. So we all have the same ontology and definitions for the day. Um, now what we're going to really talk about are the building blocks to create a cloud. And uh, we're going to talk specifically about open source. There are plenty of proprietary solutions out there. Many of them are good. Um, but there's a requirement for you to purchase or do something else so that you can participate and use those software. We want to be able to give you the tools so that you can build your cloud um, from the tools we talked about today. So uh, why open source? Definitely, as I said, it lowers the barrier to participation. Um, it's user driven, uh, typically. Typically these solutions are informed directly by users of the technology. Uh, we're going to have Ink Tank's uh, Ross Turk talking later today, and his company uh, has a project called Ceph, and Ceph was developed for DreamHost, a service provider, um, who had a problem to solve. So they were informing the design of this um, distributed file system, and that's a really good example of users um, helping design. Uh, typically, because there is this lower barrier to participation, you get more users helping users. If if you're not required to pay an entrance fee, you can get a larger community. Um, that larger community helps each other. If you look at the Linux operating system, uh, millions and millions of users helping each other in forums across the world um, to solve problems. Uh, the other thing is that open source is typically aggressive in their release cycles, and they stay um, Um, they, they typically stay uh, at, with the state of the art. So um, with the cloud industry moving as fast as it, it does, um, probably the most up-to-date and aggressive feature sets are going to be an open source versus a uh, proprietary solution that usually keeps to a two times a year release cycle and has um, other considerations than, than the open source community. Um, the other thing is we have a common set of um, values that are typical in the open source software, and that's open data, open standards, and open APIs. All right. So let's talk about private cloud infrastructure. Um, just to make sure this is a visual representation of what we just talked about, and that's the physical resources who have been abstracted to virtual resources through VM managers, operating systems, software kernels. And then we have our three uh, service models, our IAS, our PAS, and our SAS, um, are all sort of uh, smaller scopes. So people do consume directly, or you know, people, uh, users, and other uh, services can consume IAS, like um, data storage. Um, past developers may, connect, may actually consume them through a API or a IDE, and then SAS is usually end users, and you may be consuming them through an app on your phone or through a web browser. Then we have the management, and the management here on the right-hand side we're going to talk a little bit about is provisioning, patching, configuration, all the things that you need to manage the, the cloud, because we've introduced a level of, auto, of scale and uh, in spontaneity that means that you can launch a lot of infrastructure very, very quickly. So 
having good tools to handle that um, rapid elasticity is important. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. So one of the, the things that you want to consider is so we talked about how we virtualize those physical resources. And the first thing we're going to talk about is compute. And the compute resources are being virtualized through some virtualization technology, whether it's um, Zen or KVM or VMware or, or some other virtualization technology, or VM, uh, for example, or Microsoft um, Hyper-V. The key to this is that um, there is different formats for each of these hypervisors. That virtual disk image is stored differently. Um, and Amazon, which is based on the Zen hypervisor, they have a little bit of a customization. They use something called an AMI, which is Amazon Machine Image. KVM has another disk image format called QCAL2. VMware has a VMDK image. Zen uses an, as a raw disk image. And VHD um, is a, what Hyper-V uses. And I actually swapped them there. I'm sorry. The Hyper-V is the hypervisor. Or, and VHD is the format. The one thing that we do have that sort of helps make these images portable is what's called the open virtualization format. And it is basically a standard for packaging your virtual machines with some metadata. Um, you can package a single virtual machine, or you can package multiple virtual machines and share them across. Um, the only problem is that if you have a virtual machine disk, that is not co compatible to so a KVM machine disk in QCAL2 format, and you try and execute that on VMware or Zen, it's not going to work. You're going to want to have disk images that go across each um, front that are consistent across hypervisors. The OVF is really giving you some, some data about what kind of virtual machine that is so that you could be transferring it from provider to provider. Maybe at some point we all have one standard uh, disk format for all the hypervisors, but right now that's not likely. So if you take an OVF, what would happen is you would import that OVF into your um, hypervisor layer across different hyper across different clouds, and then it would install that that way. All right. So you have these disk images. Now there's two ways that you can create these disk images. The first way would be um, you would go install it from a ISO that you mount and um, install it by hand. The other one is to use one of these services that actually allows you to check off the parameters of a, of a uh, um, disk image and allow it to dynamically create one. And then you can use those dynamically created disk images to spin up, for example, a brand new Ubuntu or um, CentOS disk image that has only the stuff that you need installed. And I'm going to make these slides available after this um, presentation. So I'm not going to dive into each technology. I just want to make them available to you. And everything that's underlined in blue, they're hyperlinked to the project sites. But the thing I want you to come away with is that there are tools out there to dynamically create disk images and keep them up to date rather than doing it manually. Um, so let's go to compute clouds. So we have these hypervisors, and these hypervisors have um, uh, abstracted the host into different virtual machines. And what these hosts do right now are pools. So if we go back to our definition of resource pooling is one of the traits of the cloud. What these um, uh, orchestration tools or these compute clouds do are they take these pool, these individual hosts, and allow them to work in concert. So if I have 10 virtualized Zen um, hosts, before I would have them, when I hit the threshold of um, CPU and memory on that host, I would start up on another host. But that was a manual process. What happens with these compute clouds is they typically find the best place to, to start that next virtual machine automatically across those 10 hits and then distribute them. Um, CloudStack, David's going to talk about a little later. Uh, Eucalyptus is a, an OpenStack, our base, very viable project. Um, OpenNebula has been around for quite some time as well. Um, 
they are a little bit less known, but um, they do have many users in production as does eucalyptus. And really, I'm going to let you do your own um, research there. Obviously, I work on the cloud stack project because that's the one I, I thought was best to uh, work for and I was most interested in. Uh, and it's very impressive. Eucalyptus has a um, long track record in our industry as well. OpenStack is rather um, probably the newest to the pack, but they have a lot of uh, developer momentum around them right now. Um, and Open Nebula is uh, very uh, popular in the research and the university community. Um, but as I said, they're open source. You can check them out on your own. Going back to um, some terminology I would like to make sure everybody has, because I think uh, uh, Sebastian will probably talk about it with the scalar talk later today, is the idea of uh, scale up or scale out. Um, scale up is the um, adding additional resources to a virtual machine, so adding CPU and memory. Um, what that means is you can't just dynamically add memory to a machine and expect it not to and it to start using it. What happens is that your virtual machines, you have the ability to increase the size of their CPU and memory footprints, um, attached disk, but it requires the ability to reboot them. And because it requires reboot, it means that it could be disruptive. So when I first started hearing about the cloud, I was under the impression I would take my application, upload it to my cloud image, and it would just consume resources as long as it would need it. And that's not true. It's typically um, bounding. Those, those images are bounded by a set of parameters. And if you want to scale up, um, you're going to have to um, reboot that system. Most applications are not written for, um, are written so that they just take advantage of that single um, single instance, unless you've put some logic or load balancers and other things around it. Horizontal scaling, or scale out, is uh, really the kind of, of success stories you see in the cloud. So you see um, websites and other properties that are handling massive loads because they scale out. And what happens is that the application is written in such a way that there's additional workers can come online and handle the tasks and they're distributed across those workers. So um, a pro uh, HA proxy in front of a web cluster or Apache Hadoop, things like that are examples of scale out. All right. Now, the reason I talked about scale out was because that's how, how a application would take advantage of an IAS um, compute cluster. Now we're going to talk about cloud computing storage, and there's a couple projects out there that provide distributed file systems that um, are designed to handle petabyte scale um, data across distributed infrastructure. Um, GlusterFS, CephFS are, are examples of that. Um, they usually are handling um, what you need to have is your data has to be available to the same cluster, but you want to have clusters of data across multiple locations and you want that to replicate and, and be um, uh, uh, highly available and scalable and all those things, uh, Gluster FS and Ceph and in the KVM world, Sheepdog sort of fill that, that role. And that's really what we're talking about is that disk image for your, VM, for your main VMs. The other thing that we have is um, snapshots. So your virtual machines, you take snapshots and um, you store them. So Friday at 10, you want to take a snapshot of one of your servers running, and, and you want to do that every 24 hours. Those things usually go into long-term storage, so something like an OpenStack Swift is object storage. You could store these objects. Typically, they, don't, they are not objects that you're going to access um, frequently, and you're going to want to keep them around for a while, so that's um, OpenStack Swift. Now, for the most part, you do not have to add any of these um, new technologies to build an open source cloud. You probably already have storage, and most of your and your hypervisors, the ones we talked about today, will all support NFS. Some of them support iSCSI and some other protocols. But you will probably just mount your existing storage 
unless it's a greenfield opportunity you're going to design from scratch. And what you do then is you're mounting those images via NFS. And we all know that, that NFS has been around for a long time. It's reliable, but it's probably not going to be giving you the maximum performance for your cloud. All right. Then the final sort of thing that I want to get across is from the building your cloud, the idea of APIs. And recently, there's been a big case about Google and Oracle having a um, litigation because <clears throat> Google used some of the Java APIs that um, Oracle claims were their intellectual property. Um, so it's brought that to the forefront. I'm not going to give you a legal opinion um, on it, but when it comes to APIs, um, most people are going to access, or I shouldn't say most operations people, will probably access and manage their cloud through an API. And every cloud has seems to have its own API. The trend seems to be to have some level of compatibility with Amazon's API. That is today's de facto standard. Um, but if Amazon wanted to start down the path of litigation that they own that, that could be a risk. I doubt that'll happen. But um, your other option to give to keep you um, open and access to multiple APIs is to use an abstraction. And these abstractions that I've listed here, all they do is they broker your calls from, they are an API broker, and then they control clouds. So jclouds is a, is a library that you can embed in your application so that you could call their API and it would translate it to other cloud APIs. And you could call different clouds so you could actually control a cloud stack cloud and an Amazon cloud via J clouds. Lib cloud, Delta cloud, and Fog, they are more like a RESTful API translator. So you would make AP call, API calls to them, and they would be able to translate those calls to other clouds. And that gives you the option that if you choose cloud providers later on, that you don't have to re-instrument all your tools to um, call those clouds. Okay. We're going to hit on the, so that was the whole infrastructure as a service. That's the bottom layer. That's taking your compute, your storage, and your networking. I didn't really touch on networking because that could be a day onto itself. But, uh, but it takes that stuff, it controls it, and takes the discrete elements, pulls it to make give you one elastic compute environment. The next um, layer above that is the platform as a service. Uh, as I said, there's uh, Diane from Staccato is going to talk about that a little bit more today. Um, Cloud Foundry is, is VMware's efforts in the past space. A lot of, and they have a lot of momentum. Um, they are, the idea is that you would have these containers that abstract out that auto scaling, that abstract, that are portable, that allow you as an application developer to create an application and have it cloudify. So if we go back to that scale up and scale out, the, in principle, what it's doing is allowing you to do the scale up while behind the scenes it's taking care of all these scale out um, elements. All right. So that's that's the the cloud pass and IAS. And if you're interested in that stuff, the links are all in this presentation and so on slideshare.net slash um, cloud stack for your perusal later. Um, the, uh, let's talk next, we're going to talk about managing clouds with open source. So here is the old school. The old school is uh, when I used to be allowed to administer servers, I would call up Dell on the telephone, I would order the server, it would be, it would arrive a couple days later, I would put it on a skid, take it to a rack, pick it up, screw it down, plug in a keyboard and start configuring it. And that was very, very very time consuming. It was very slow. And um, it took a lot of people to bring up a lot of servers at once. And that's why I call them eCloud. Now I can take my, my credit card, go to a cloud provider, and spin up a thousand instances in, a few, in virtually a few minutes through a click of a few buttons. And 
the issue is that once you spin them up to make them productive, you've got to be able to manage them. And if it's still required, now that you can bring up so many more machines so much faster, you can't scale the meat cloud. So you've got to figure out how you're going to automate. And uh, the way you're going to autom or automate is by using some of these tools and some principles like DevOps um, and Agile Operations to actually figure out how you can um, uh, quantify, identify um, repetitive processes and make them happen easily over and over again. So, um, we're going to talk quickly about four types of management tools and how they apply to the cloud, patching and provisioning, config management, orchestration, automation, and monitoring. And I'm going to jump right into them because we are on a short time frame today. Um, what I want you to take away from that is those types of, of tools. The idea is to not have them be silos anymore, but I want you to be able to take your individual tools and have the input or the uh, output of one tool inform the input of another. So if I do monitor something and it fails, Ideally, it can learn one of the tools that does other um, active things and have, have it actually um, fix what's wrong, or at least start to fix, or queue it up and allow you to approve that fix so that it's no longer a manual process for you to take that information, process it, and repair the cloud, because um, we don't have that kind of time anymore. So um, patching and provisioning. This is really specific to the Linux community because they've, they've nailed this in spades. And there's other op applications out there in the proprietary world do it for other operating systems. I just feel like in the cloud space, Linux guests are, it's easy to do this and there's a lot of tools. But the idea is, as we talked about with Box Grinder and Bitnami and CC Build System earlier, is that you would generate a Linux operating system guest from package repo. And what you're just going to start with is just enough OS. It's just, just what you need so that there's very few add-ons or anything that's going to cause security holes. And then what you're going to do is um, add your applications to that. And then you're going to keep that update, that image updated through RPM and apt. So maybe um, you have a repo of all the props, of all the software that runs on your Linux guest within your firewall. And when it's time to update those guests, they go to that repo and they pull those packages, not directly from, from CentOS or Ubuntu or Fedora, but from the repo that you created so that you have a single point so that you know that, that you are pulling the latest and greatest that you've approved, not the latest and greatest that has been put into those repos by community. And uh, that's going to give you some standardization. So. You might be using, in, in an outsourced world, that standardization may be coming from one of these vendors like Bitnami or eShareSoft or CC Build System. Or if you decide to do it yourself with something like BoxGrinder, you would have those repays within your firewall, within your control. So um, that is patching and provisioning. Config management, this is a really hot topic right now because once you have your images, up and running, you want to make sure that they are um, configured so that they can go into service. A lot of people don't use config management, but it's one of the most powerful tools out there. It's going to allow you to set those parameters for you know, web servers, application servers, firewall rules, things like that. You're going to be able to define roles, and those roles will have variables. So if I have a certain yellow zone server, for example, I want to have certain firewall rules and I want to use the IP tables on Linux. I can actually have these configurations and whenever I bring on a server that I spin up for my just enough OS coming out of Bitnami or Box Grinder, um, Box Grinder would actually be a good example there. I can actually, as soon as that's done, apply these rules via configuration management, which is a uh, client server tool like Puppet Chef or CF Engine. And ideally, these tools are going to integrate with other tools. Um, all, right. Um, all right. The next thing I have going on is cloud monitoring. And that's monitor host, guest, and orchestration layer. Um, that's, that's the key is 
you probably have monitoring tools already, and those monitoring tools are um, monitoring your legacy infrastructure. When it comes to monitoring the cloud, you you got to look at what's going on underneath the virtualization layer, what's going on above the virtualization layer, and then the orchestration layer that's probably bridging those two, as well as the network, so that you understand that where your failures are. Monitoring is probably one of the boring, most boring parts of management, and very few people do it well. But when you're doing your cloud, you're going to look at availability testing for your guests. You're going to look at performance monitoring for your guests in your house. You're going to look at event management for everything. You're going to understand, for example, you may be pulling your orchestration layer, which is um, Eucalyptus or OpenStack or CloudStack, through their API to get service metrics and understand what's going on between the two worlds, events. There's not a lot of monitoring tools out there that are cloud savvy yet. So the ability to pull in events from whatever event management logs you can get and then actually interpret them is probably pretty important. Um, you also could want to duplicate um, user experience through synthetic transactions um, automate the experience that your users have, and then you're going to want to monitor the network for, just like you always have for latency, bandwidth, quality of service. Now here's the thing that I think is uh, important because there's a theme of my tool chain. The one thing when you're alerted before you would be alerted by a pager, and you still probably should, or via cell phone or email or whatever mechanism you choose, but those alerts also have to be easily passed to other management tools if you want to create that tool chain. Um, that's, that's my overview on this. I have a whole index of tools at the back of this presentation that I think are good for this. Uh, Nagios for availability monitoring, Cloud, or, um, uh, Graphite for, for performance monitoring. Xenos does all three of these. I think it's pretty good. I used to work on the Xenos project. Um, and there's quite a few other ones. But if you want to go figure out which open source tools are after the, the presentation, you can go download them. Um, the one thing I would advise you is don't monitor your cloud from inside your cloud. So don't, don't install your cloud monitoring as a guest inside the cloud because A, for security reasons, it should be, it'll be isolated from the underlying um, uh, virtualization host and some degree the, the uh, management monitoring, the orchestration layer. So you won't have full visibility. The other thing is that you always want to be somewhere else so that you can um, simulate what your end user experience is like. So um, ideally, you're collecting that data from where your users are at and not within your cloud. All right, this is the final management tools. And this is really what, what helps you make the tool chain and actually makes that information actionable. Um, they can execute tasks via APIs. Um, they could start and stop services. Uh, you could, for example, um, use these automation tools after you've configured a service to start to restart it through the uh, init.d scripts in Linux. Um, you could have arbitrary scripts that audit and set security rules on your hosts everywhere, and you could execute them, and that feedback would come back to you. Um, uh, you also want these tools to integrate with other systems management tools. So the ones that I think are worth looking at are Capistrano, which is sort of like a desktop tool to execute a lot of scripts across multiple servers. Um, Rundeck is another one that's really good. Um, they use that at Zynga, the web gaming company. Um, M Collective is another one that's done by Puppet Labs, who also makes one of the config management tools. Um, M Collective and, and Puppet Labs, or Puppet, are a example of configuration management, and then using M Collective to do that post configuration work. And then there's a new one called SaltStack that uses Zero MQ to actually execute scripts across other um, servers and receive some feedback. All this stuff is could be Dave's talk on their own. I just want to expose you to the ideas of how you would uh, um, automate and do command and control in your network. So this is why I, I, where I really wanted to 
you to get you to is after you've built your cloud and you start managing it, I want you to think about how to generate your images automatically through SUSE or Box Grinder as an example here. Start that bootstrapped image through calling the API of CloudStack or OpenStack or whatever your IAS provider is. You could provision that um, uh, image through a tool called Cobbler, which is actually do a little bit more. So if you perhaps use SUSE Studio to generate uh, a juice OS, but you have a internal repo of uh, specific applications, you can use Cobbler that would actually use the uh, RPM package system to install across all those different um, services. And finally, you would have, after that they have started, you'd have Puppet or Chef go out there and do that post-install configuration. And once you've installed that and or configured it, the last thing is you would start and stop services and you could use one of the tools I mentioned earlier. And as one of the other things that you could do either through the configuration manager or through the automation is you could insert that host into one of your monitoring tools. So if you were using Nagios upon um, configuring a, a host, you could actually tell Puppet to configure Nagios to start monitoring this host at this IP address on these ports or with these plugins, and Nagios would automatically do it. And then ideally, if you hook that all up, you can use um, that monitoring data to go out and start and, and control these other images through either your um, command and control or through an integration with Puppet or Chef or um, Cobbler so that if an image, if a part of your infrastructure fails, that it can be restarted um, or rebuilt from scratch and um, you'll have some fallover. All right, that is my presentation. As I said, these slides can be um, downloaded from CloudStack. It's a lot of material. I wanted to give you the overview because I think throughout the day you'll have um, plenty of chances to have the details filled in, but this is sort of where we're going. Abstract out your, your physical resources into a, a private cloud infrastructure, automate, manage it, and make it scalable to meet your needs and have that Amazon EC2 style cloud in your data center the way you want it. So with that being said, are there any questions, Gerilyn? Yeah, uh, Mark, you have a few questions. Um, what I would like to do is um, um, we'll, we'll try to run through a few of them. We're running a few minutes behind. And then um, if we're not able to answer them live, um, we'll file up in an email. Um, to, to you folks afterwards. Um, the first question is, um, can a cloud, uh, can a company running a mission critical cloud afford to frequently open, uh, update its open source software? Which I you know, think is a, a question of general interest. Yeah, so, I mean, it, and the answer is, it depends. So, if you have, like we said before, you have resource pools and We've pulled these individual houses into the pool. So you can, because of that, um, you can actually move stuff off of um, different clusters onto our and hosts and have the old host be updated without having any risk of, of downtime. So that gives you the ability to move stuff around. When it comes to your orchestration layer, um, that's a little trickier because that is the, that's the uh, uh, forward-facing um, broker and to all of your cloud infrastructure, and that's not so so uh, um, um, easy to do because it will have service impacts. But the nice thing is with the open source software, you can evaluate and choose which um, which tools or, or which uh, software packages you're going to update date and when. And typically, there's a pretty long uh, support life for these tools, so you can do it on your schedule, not so much on the schedule of a vendor. Um, I would say that um, the advantage of most of these tools, especially in the cloud, is they're pretty aggressive in their release cycle, so the features are there. But I don't say think that it's necessary to update them unless you want to. Um, so that would be my pat answer to that. 
Great, thanks. Um, so we have a question about uh, private clouds and, and virtual VPN. So uh, first off, can you make create a private cloud with CloudStack? Just a little clarification around that. And then, what would be you know, is there functionality to enable a VPN between a um, a you know a public uh, instance and, and a private uh, cloud instance using private, uh, CloudStack? Yeah, yeah. So you can add network capabilities to to a service offering within. Uh, within your cloud stack cloud for your individual users. But you could also create VPNs between uh, a public cloud and a private cloud. Um, what they call within the, within the public cloud, cloud is a group of resources you can put into a virtual private cloud, just like it would be a physical location in your legacy data center. And then you could put a, uh, the v create that VPN between a uh, well-secured cloud stack cloud or, or any cloud that's behind your firewall and just control the traffic that way. Um, usually there's a, um, up above the cloud level within your data center, you already have some kind of switching that's, that's similar, that's like your, um, the same as your legacy data center um, to protect it, protect it but uh, if you had, if you wanted to serve out on an individual level, you could create um, VPN as part of your offering and your guests. Thanks, Mark. Um, so, so, yeah. So, one one more question for you. Um, just a, a user who wants to run an application in the cloud and serve up the output to a mobile device. So, maybe a little bit of a discussion about how you could do that. So um, you're probably going to look at, and it depends also on the scale. I mean, I'm saying at a certain scale, it makes sense to do a private cloud or at a, with certain security concerns. And at another scale, it may be better to use public cloud. But if you're talking about the application layer, specifically a mobile application, you may want to consider taking the um, application and writing it for one of the past layers, like Staccato, we're going to talk about later. And then you can decide whether you want to put that on top of a infrastructure as a service cloud, like CloudStack, or if you want to put that um, uh, on a um, hosting provider like Amazon or um, one of the the other um, hosted services to offer that. But it's really a matter of what economics you and what level of control are you looking for, as it is with any kind of cloud, open source or proprietary. Great. Thanks, Mark. Well, with that, I think we're going to go ahead and um, wrap up this session and then turn um, things over to Mike McClure. So, Mark, thank you very much for um, from your great, your great presentation on open source cloud computing. And um, if you guys have questions, Mark's contact information is up on the screen. And um, we, as there were several questions that came in regarding um, whether we will post slides and video, and the answer is yes. You'll get an email.